Chapter One of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One A Mysterious Mission. From the main thoroughfare of Bayswater, where the shops display their goods and the tides of life run strongly, Crook Street extends its long line of ugly dwellings to a considerable distance its shape suggests a shepherd's crook hence undoubtedly the name as it finally terminates in a curved cul-de-sac the end of which is blocked by number one hundred and eleven this is an imposing if somewhat dilapidated mansion standing in its own limited grounds which are surrounded by a high crumbling wall of brick more or less overgrown with grimy ivy there is a small front garden planted with stunted shrubs a narrow passage on either side of the house screened midway by green-painted trellis work and at the back a worn-out lawn dominated by a funereal cedar beneath this through rain and sunshine is a rustic table and a rustic seat where the boarders have afternoon tea in summer time everywhere there is a feeling of dampness the mansion is of georgian architecture square and heavy greatly in need of a coat of paint which it has not received for years with its discoloured surface once white its cheap stucco scaling off in leprous patches its trails of moss and soot never to be washed off by any rain however violent it looks a tumble-down ruinous sort of dwelling or as an imaginative boarder once suggested it is like a derelict hulk stranded in a stagnant backwater of life's mighty river it is certainly doleful and infinitely dreary only securing inhabitants by reason of the unusually cheap board and lodging to be obtained under its weather-worn roof mrs sellers who rented this sad suburban dwelling euphoniously called it the home of art and in a seductive advertisement invited any male or female connected with music literature painting poetry and more particularly with the drama to enjoy the refinements of an aesthetic abode at the moderate cost of twenty shillings a week inclusive as the house was shabbily comfortable and its mistress was a retired actress of cheery manners still indirectly connected with the stage the bedrooms of the home of art were generally occupied by youths and maidens ambitious of renown there were very few really old people as mrs sellers although elderly herself did not care for the agent who had no future but loved to gather the young and aspiring round her hospitable table and that same table truly deserved the kindly term for the slatternly good-natured woman supplied far better food in larger quantities than the rate of payment allowed indeed it is questionable if mrs sellers made any profit whatsoever as nearly all the boarders were juvenile and hungry but what they paid together with the landlady's small private income kept things going in a happy-go-lucky fashion which was all that was necessary the children as mrs sellers called her boarders adored ma as the boarders called mrs sellers and with good reason for she gave one and all largely what money could not buy she advised she sympathized she nursed she scolded and to her the children came with their troubles great and small for aid and consolation it was no wonder that with such a blessed helper of humanity the ruinous old suburban boarding-house was usually filled to its greatest capacity but full as the home of art was last november on one night of that foggy month it was empty from seven o'clock until midnight of all the boarders a third-floor lodger the lean youth with bright and bird-like eyes had not only written a play which ma pronounced magnificent but the same was to be produced on this very evening at a suburban theatre of course this was a red-letter day or rather night at the home of art and equally of course mrs sellers led forth her children to occupy boxes and stalls and pit and dress circle 
on the great occasion by her advice the friends of the playwright were thus fairly distributed throughout the house so that they might applaud vehemently at the right moment and stir up the public to enthusiasm even the cook and the parlour-maid the housemaid and a decayed butler who had fallen through drink from mayfair to bayswater put on their best clothes and departed for the night's entertainment already the supper and a very good supper too was laid out in the shabby dining-room and would be eaten at midnight by the boarders when they returned with ma and the successful playwright and assuredly he would be successful no one had any doubt on that point for mrs sellers had long since infected all her lodgers with her constant optimism with ma as the head of the house the atmosphere could scarcely fail to be cheerful even debts duns difficulties disappointments and suspense could not and never did damp the hopeful spirits of the little community and ma with her unfailing good humour and helpful nature was responsible for this happy state of affairs when the occupants of the home of art departed for the curtain theatre two people remaining behind had the entire house to themselves one was mrs pentreddle who had sprained her ankle on the previous day and could not leave the sofa on which she lay in the drawing-room with any degree of comfort and the other was patricia carroll the out-of-work irish governess who had arranged to stop and look after the old lady and mrs pentreddle was really old being not far short of sixty she was the landlady's sister who had come up from devonshire on a visit six days before the exodus to the theatre a tall gaunt grim woman wholly unlike mrs sellers in looks and disposition no one would have believed the two women to be sisters had not the relationship been vouched for by ma herself martha never was like me said mrs sellers when her boarders commented on the dissimilarity always as heavy as i was light comedy and tragedy our pa called us in the old days not that martha ever had any turn for the stage it was only pa's way of talking martha's a killjoy poor dear as her late husband was drowned at sea and her only child's a sailor also who likewise may find his grave in the vast and wandering deep she's housekeeper to squire colpster of beckley in devonshire and knows more about managing servants than i've ever forgotten and as usual she finished with her jolly laugh mrs pentreddle certainly was no favourite with the boarders as her lean and anxious wrinkled and pallid face her hard black eyes and melancholy dark garments impressed them unpleasantly she spoke very little but constantly maintained a watchful attitude as though she was expecting something to happen or someone to tap her on her shoulder as a rule she kept in mrs sellers private sitting-room which pleased every one as the dour woman was such a wet blanket but on the night of the play she insisted upon being carried down to the drawing-room in spite of the sprained ankle which should have kept her in bed mrs sellers remonstrated but the sister from devonshire had her own way saying that the first floor was preferable to the second as it was less dismal and more comfortable one would think that martha expected something to happen said cheerful mrs sellers when she set out for the theatre with her train and was afraid to be too far away from the nearest policeman this remark was afterwards remembered when something did happen as emblematic of ma's prophetic powers the drawing-room was a large apartment with a fireplace at one end and a door leading from the hall at the other one side was taken up by the windows heavily curtained and the other by large folding doors usually closed which gave admission to the dining-room outside a narrow iron-railed balcony ran in front of the three windows from the entrance door to the corner of the house and below this was the basement within the room was fairly comfortable in a shabby slatternly sort of way although overcrowded with furniture of the albert period which had been picked up at various sales indeed the entire room was furnished with the flotsam and jetsam of auction-room derelicts of prosperous days 
in the drawing-room were rep-covered chairs two horsehair sofas several round tables each poised on its shaky leg fender stools berlin wool screens a glittering glass chandelier and on either side of the handsome marble timepiece which stood on the mantel-shelf antique green ornaments with dangling prisms of glass the walls were covered with faded scarlet flock paper the floor with a worn red carpet bestrewn with bunches of poppies mingled with wheat ears and the three windows were draped with stained ragged crimson curtains of rich brocade mrs sellers was very proud of those gorgeous curtains but they were distinctly out of date a matter of indifference to those who occupied the home of art in spite of its name one of the horsehair sofas had been drawn to the fire and mrs pentreddle lay thereon with her hard black eyes fixed on the leaping flames outside the night was chilly and damp the air was thick with fog and even in the drawing-room could be heard the dripping of water from the ivy clothing the surrounding wall in spite of its being in london the house was markedly isolated and only occasionally did a policeman venture down the curved cul-de-sac but within all was shabbily warm and comfortable and mrs pentreddle's grim face relaxed into more pleasant lines nothing could be heard but the dripping of the water the ticking of the clock and the occasional fall of a morsel of coal from the gate but shortly the almost silence became oppressive and mrs pentreddle spoke in her harsh voice it's very kind of you to stay with me miss carroll she said glancing sideways at her companion few young ladies would do that when a theatre treat is offered to them the girl addressed raised her eyes from an evening paper which she had been reading and smiled patricia carroll's smile was delightful and displayed such white teeth that her beauty was enhanced but even when her face was in repose she looked an extremely pretty girl and was one of those richly coloured irish brunettes who remind the observer of a peach ripening against a mellow brick wall her hair was bluish black of a wavy quality which lent itself admirably to the style of coiffure which she affected and her eyes were sea-blue of that wonderful irish tint which goes so well with dark tresses her admirable figure was clothed plainly but tastefully in a prussian blue serge dress perfectly cut and worn with a charming natural grace her hands and feet were slim and aristocratic and her whole air was one of repose and good breeding she was a flower of civilization and should have bloomed amidst more fitting surroundings than the shabby drawing-room could afford yet she was only a poor little governess seeking for employment and even when mrs pentreddle spoke to her she had been searching the columns of the newspaper in the hope of finding a situation oh i am very pleased to stay with you mrs pentreddle she said with her charming smile i have too many troubles to care about going to a play i would only take them with me and then would scarcely enjoy the performance that is true replied the elder woman examining the girl closely and yet you should have no troubles at your age and with your looks patricia coloured and shook her head my looks are really against me she said somewhat sadly ladies don't like to engage me on that account if i were ugly and old i should be better able to get what i want what do you want miss carroll asked mrs pentreddle abruptly fifty pounds a year as a nursery governess if i can get it replied the girl promptly or even thirty so long as i can get a situation if it were not for dear cunt mrs Southers, i don't think i could hold out she's an angel and lets me stay here for ten shillings a week until i can get something to do bless her how did you come to this asked mrs pentreddle still abruptly miss carroll coloured for she did not like to whimper about her misfortunes to strangers it's a long story she said evasively all you need to know is that my father was a colonel in the army and that when he died his pension ceased and i was left penniless but i have had a good education and i hope to get a situation as a governess 
won't your friends assist you i have no friends said the girl simply when i left the world i was brought up in i left my friends for ever i don't think so you will go back to them some day said mrs pentreddle encouragingly although the expression of her iron face did not soften but meanwhile if you wish to earn a five-pound note she hesitated the newspaper slipped from patricia's lap to the ground and she looked surprised i don't understand if you will do an errand for me i will give you five pounds oh i can do an errand for you without taking money i don't ask you to this is a rather dangerous errand but i think you are brave and i know that you are hard up patricia interrupted i have enough money to go on with she said flushing at ten shillings a week retorted mrs pentreddle unpleasantly well please yourself she turned over on the sofa i have given you the chance miss carroll thought hard during the silence which ensued certainly in her pauper condition five pounds would be a godsend and as she had determined to lay aside all pride when she gave up the position to which her birth entitled her she considered that she might as well take what she could get at this difficult stage of her fortunes for five pounds she would do much but is the errand an honest one she asked suddenly with a catch in her voice the thought had just struck her perfectly honest said mrs pentreddle coldly what is there about me that you should think me capable of asking you to do something wrong nothing at all confessed miss carroll frankly but if you wish me to go on a mysterious errand it is only natural that i should desire to hear everything about it mrs pentreddle carefully lowered her injured foot to the ground and sitting up very straight folded two thin hands on her lap you shall hear said she quietly only i must request you to keep your own counsel patricia nodded that goes without the saying was her answer and she again wondered if the five pounds could be earned honestly i came up to london to go on this errand myself explained the old lady slowly but the sprain has prevented my keeping an appointment which must be kept to-night as the matter is important i am willing to pay you the money on your return with it it what is it a small deal box you can easily carry in your hand a man will give it to you if you will stand at nine o'clock by the right-hand corner of that bridge which crosses the serpentine on this side remember before you cross the bridge nine o'clock and you must hold this she fished among the cushions of the sofa and produced a small bull's-eye lantern the glass of which was pasted over with red paper this is the signal the signal echoed miss carroll rather nervously for all this mystery did indeed hint at something criminal oh you needn't turn so white said mrs pentreddle scornfully what i ask you to do is perfectly straightforward there is nothing wrong about it patricia still hesitated vaguely afraid to be implicated in such unusual doings if you will explain further mrs pentreddle there is nothing more need to be explained just now interrupted the other woman imperiously when you return with the box you shall know all what i am requesting you to do can harm no one but can benefit some one yourself no that is in a way perhaps but you can judge for yourself when i am able to tell you my reason that will be when you return if five pounds is not sufficient i can give you ten although i can ill afford it i am satisfied with five said patricia quickly and flushing again for even in her poverty she shrank from taking money i don't like mysteries and only accept your offer as i need money very badly but for all the wealth in the world i would not go if i thought that there was anything wrong and she looked searchingly at her companion how many times do you need me to assure you that there is nothing wrong said mrs pentreddle impatiently you are singularly suspicious for a girl of your years 
all that is necessary is for you to receive this tiny box from the man who will hand it to you how shall i know the man there is no need for you to know him at all the red light of the lantern will assure him that you are the person who is to receive the box well miss carroll rose nervously and ran her fingers through her hair as she walked up and down the long room her instinct told her to refuse a mission about which she knew so little but the prospect of earning five pounds in this easy manner was so alluring that she could not find it in her heart to decline after all mrs pentreddle was the sister of the woman who had been and was so kind to her and in every way appeared to be an almost aggressively respectable person it was worth risking she thought and at this moment as though to clinch the matter mrs pentreddle's voice broke in on her uneasy meditations i can't wait much longer said the old woman if you won't do what i ask perhaps you will telephone to the nearest office asking that a messenger boy may be sent to get what i want it will certainly be cheaper this proposal banished patricia's last scruple as if a messenger boy could be employed the errand mysterious as it seemed could not have anything to do with criminal matters miss carroll picked up the lantern with its faked red glass i shall go at once she declared hurriedly for now she feared lest she should lose the money but who will attend to your foot while i am away mrs pentreddle i can stay here as i am doing rest is the sole thing which can cure my sprain you will only be away an hour more or less it is a quarter past eight now and the distance to the serpentine bridge is not far nine o'clock is the hour you know exactly what you have to do and she repeated her instructions to which the girl listened carefully i am to show the red light standing on this side of the serpentine at the right-hand corner of the bridge she said slowly to be sure that she knew what she had to do i understand what shall i say to the man nothing he will simply place a box in your hand and walk away all you have to do is to bring the box to me and then you shall know all about the matter which strikes you as being so strange don't lose any time please indeed there was no time to be lost as it would take patricia some minutes to get her out-of-door things on she ran up the stairs and assumed boots in place of slippers a heavy cloak as the night was damp a plain cloth toque and gloves she then took her umbrella in one hand the lantern unlighted in the other and descended to say a few last words to mrs pentreddle or rather to hear them for the old lady gave her no opportunity of speaking for such a grim unemotional woman mrs pentreddle seemed quite excited although she tried to keep herself calm but a vivid spot of red was certainly showing itself on either pale cheek show the red light and wait in silence she directed do nothing more and say nothing at all then when you receive the box come back with it at once to me you thoroughly understand i thoroughly understand i am glad finally let me assure you once more that, that there is nothing dishonest or even wrong about the errand i am sending you on there was nothing more to be said and patricia departed when she closed the front door of the home of art and found herself in the street she became aware that the night was damp and dense with fog the gas lights however shone blurred and vague through the white mists so there was no need for her to use the lantern no one was about not even a policeman in the curve of the cul-de-sac at all events but when she passed into the straight line of crook street she almost fell into the arms of a constable who was standing under a lamp patricia paused to ask a question will the fog get worse officer i think it will miss said the man touching his helmet and bending to look at her face i should advise you not to go far i am only going to the park to see a friend answered miss carroll heedlessly and then remembering that it was a complete stranger whom she had to see and one to whom she was not even to speak she regretted having been so doubtfully truthful what is the time she asked to cover her confusion half-past eight o'clock miss said the constable 
consulting a fat silver watch best go home again miss you might get lost in this fog and in the park there are some rough characters about oh i am all right thank you said patricia with a bright smile and passed along all the same she now began to feel uncomfortable and to realize that hyde park on a foggy november night was not exactly the place for a young lady only the desire to earn the coveted five pounds nerved her to do that which she had agreed to do crook street is not far from the main entrance to the park on the bayswater side and as the fog grew thin further on patricia found herself speedily on the broad path which leads directly to the serpentine bridge she knew this portion of the park extremely well as having much time on her hands she frequently wandered about the grassy spaces on idle afternoons there were few people about as the night was so disagreeable and those she saw moved swiftly past her occasionally she caught a glimpse of vague forms under the trees but she never looked closely at these night prowlers but keeping in the middle of the path moved steadily to her destination at last she came to the bridge and took up her station at the right-hand corner on this near side having come to the end of her journey she lighted the lantern across the water the broad bridge stretched weirdly vanishing into the fog which here grew denser like the bridge of life in the vision of mirza patricia had read addison's fantastic story in some school-book and it was suggested to her again by the sight before her people came out of the mist and disappeared into it again some passed unconscious of the quiet figure at the corner while others peered into her face but no one addressed her much to her relief and the ruddy light of her lantern shone like an angry star then the expected happened in one moment and quite without preparation a man came swiftly over the bridge so swiftly that it might have been said that he was running she had no time to see what he was like in looks or how he was dressed before he got sight of the red light and stopped for one moment to thrust a small box into her hand then he darted away to the left and disappeared along the bank on the bayswater side that was all End of chapter one Chapter two of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter two. What happened? For some moments, Patricia stood still with a box in her hand and stared into the gloomy fog behind which the man was retreating. Another man passed her swiftly, as if in pursuit of the first, but halted for one single moment to look at her she was an indistinct figure in the misty air but she could feel that his eyes were piercing her through and through a few seconds later and he disappeared also but whither he went she could not tell the whole oddity of the episode startled her although much that had taken place had been anticipated and described by mrs pentreddle as the name flashed across miss carroll's brain she remembered that she had yet to complete her mission by taking back the box to the old lady almost mechanically and with the lantern still burning she began to retrace her steps in the direction of bayswater the fog was growing denser but by her knowledge of the path and the feel of the hard gravel under her feet she was enabled to avoid getting lost a sudden sense of weariness which no doubt came from the slackening of her nervous tension overcame her and she was glad to sink down on the first bench she came to this was near a gas lamp and in the blurred circle of light she felt safe from the attentions of any night bird then a strange thing happened it was a sensation and nothing more one connected with the small box she held so tightly clasped in her hand as she gripped it she felt with her sixth sense no doubt that waves of force were radiating from its interior patricia's body being celtic was strung with extraordinarily delicate nerves and by these she was made aware of many influences which passed by less highly organized mortals nine human beings out of ten would not have felt the radiating influence of whatever was contained in the box but she did 
and as wave after wave extended outward she felt as though some invisible force was driving back invisible evil the nervous fears she had hitherto felt and no wonder considering the hour and the place and the mission vanished entirely and she smiled to think that anything could ever have frightened her a warm light felt rather than seen seemed to envelop her and within its charmed circle no evil could come had a robber attacked her had an earthquake happened had a storm of thunder and lightning devastated the air she would not have felt the least fear the regular waves of this strange force passed ever outward repelling all harm all fear her body thrilled to the pulsations it was as though some unseen being was draping her in his mantle of power naturally she connected these weird manifestations with the box and that with mrs pentreddle how came it she asked herself that so commonplace a woman should be connected with so extraordinary an object and then she recollected that she had not set eyes on the object whatever it might be yet to do so she had only to look into the box opening the shutter of the lantern in which the glass was set so that she could see by the natural light and not by the red glare she examined the box it was a common deal case very small and very roughly made with the lid held down by a thin wire in fact it was only one of those boxes furnished by shopkeepers to customers so that delicate goods china glass and such like might be carried away without danger of breakage it was not even swathed in paper or bound with string it seemed strange that if what the box contained were valuable or dangerous more precautions had not been taken in rendering its contents safe then again the man who had delivered it in so odd a way had been overcome with fear patricia guessed that when she remembered his laboured breathing the backward glance he had thrown over his shoulder and the hurried way in which he had made off after thrusting the box into her hand finally there was no doubt that the other man who had halted for the moment was in pursuit patricia looked up when she arrived at this point of her meditations but could see no one although she heard some footsteps dying away and others approaching on the hard gravel and all the time she was considering things the waves of power still continued to radiate as they had banished her fears they had also stimulated her limbs and she no longer felt weary this being the case she half rose to return to the home of art since there was no longer any reason for delay but being a woman she was curious and desired to see what it was that produced these queer sensations and indeed a less inquisitive person would have also acted as she now did for it is the desire of all to learn the why and the wherefore of the unknown almost without thinking and certainly without consideration patricia untwisted the wire and peered into the depths of the box in the vivid light of the lamp a green radiance flashed upward and outward and she uttered an exclamation of surprise and delight she would scarcely have been a woman had she not done so at the bottom of the tiny box and as if it had been hastily thrown in was a jewel the like of which she had never set eyes upon with a gasp of pleasure she took it in her hand never casting a thought to the danger of, of that public examination at that dark hour in that lonely locality she might easily have been robbed and rendered insensible by a blow as she sat there spellbound gazing at the brilliant object which just covered the palm of her gloved hand a more lovely thing she had never seen the luminous green poured from the heart of a large emerald perfectly cut and polished it formed the centre of a flower the petals of which were cut out of some hard dull green stone with exquisite art as the girl stared entirely fascinated by the sight she became aware that the whole lovely jewel represented a chrysanthemum blossom of which the emerald was the central glory from this radiated the regular petals of the blossom layer upon layer in perfect circles until the outward round extended in delicate points to all quarters of the compass like the corona of the sun 
and as this wonderful object lay on her open hand patricia felt still more strongly the waves of invisible force which radiated therefrom it was as if some glorious power was welling up from the depths of the emerald to stream off from every carved petal it was no wonder that she stared half hypnotized by the marvel suddenly even a stranger thing happened in a single moment as it seemed the force appeared to falter and weaken the light which she felt was around her died away and the darkness of the night closed in with uncomfortable swiftness the radiance vanished from the jewel and with a rush all her fears came back as though some magic no longer kept them at bay she felt no sensation at all in the carved chrysanthemum she saw no glory no charm it was simply a beautiful ornament and nothing more just as she realized this with a murmur of dismay someone suddenly leapt lightly forward and snatched the jewel from her hand before she could rise to her feet the robber disappeared into the mist running as delicately and swiftly as a startled cat the terrified girl was left alone in the fog with the empty box for a single moment she remained stunned and motionless and then leaving lantern and umbrella and empty box behind she started to run wildly after the thief vaguely guessing the direction he had taken in a few minutes she had completely lost herself amongst the trees and then became aware with a shock of fear that she had left the path for the grassy spaces of the park there was no sign of the robber peer as she might here there and everywhere into the surrounding gloom and she sank down on the wet sward under a dripping tree to weep with shame at the failure of her mission she had betrayed her trust she had lost the treasure how could she face mrs pentreddle without that which she had been sent to fetch but for her curiosity in opening the box the valuable jewel would not have been stolen some thief of the night must have seen her examining its beauty by lantern light and forthwith had secured it for his own or it might be and this was a second thought the man who had followed the other the man who had paused to look at her piercing the darkness with cat-like vision was the thief in that case there might be a chance of recovering the jewel as mrs pentreddle might know the name of the person who desired her property but was it mrs pentreddle's property and if it was why should it have been delivered in so mysterious a fashion and why should the first man have been afraid of the second man who pursued him finally presuming that the pursuer had snatched the ornament from her hand why should he have done so patricia's head buzzed with these questions and she sat on the watery grass almost weeping at her inability to answer any one of them the position was terrible she had lost the jewel and the five pounds also as mrs pentreddle certainly would not pay her the money but this was not the time for weeping nor was patricia carroll a very tearful person the only thing to be done was to return to mrs pentreddle and make a clean breast of the whole occurrence the old lady might know how to deal with the matter seeing that there was some strange tale connected with the deal box and its contents of which patricia was unaware such knowledge would probably enable mrs pentreddle to take steps for the recovery of her property the police would be called in and but here the girl paused would the police be called in considering the mystery of the whole affair patricia on swift reflection thought not but she thought here her patience gave way and she rose hastily unable to put up further with the torment of her vexed brain the most obvious thing to be done was to see mrs pentreddle at once and explain there was no other course open to her but the girl's nerves quivered at the thought of the very unpleasant quarter of an hour she would probably have however it was no use being a coward and she stumbled as quickly as she could towards the broad path anxious to reach the bench upon which she had left her umbrella the lantern and the empty box but the night was so gloomy and the fog so dense that she became confused amidst the multiplicity of trees with some violence she ran against one and falling half stunned to the ground lay there quite unable to rise 
patricia was a clever and self-reliant girl accustomed to act immediately and firmly in all emergencies but this adventure had robbed her of calmness and of all will-power she felt as though the end of the world had come and in the cold damp lonely darkness she could have cried for help and comfort like a frightened child but she retained sufficient self-command not to do so and even exerted her will sufficiently to again stagger to her feet and strive to find her bearings with outstretched hands she wandered trying to gain a glimpse of some light but all in vain then began a nightmare journey through the gloomy woods here was a girl in the heart of london as wholly lost as a babe in some primeval forest she stumbled here and groped there in an aimless fashion until her senses became so confused that she did not know what to do several times she dropped several times she rose and for hours as it seemed she moved onward towards an ever-receding goal doubtless she was moving in a circle after the fashion of the lost and in her vague wanderings she lost all count of time in her heart she began to wish that the dawn would come to reveal her whereabouts as in this darkness she certainly would never succeed in escaping from the enchantments of this urban wood and so patricia dragged on and the night dragged on and the effort to get back to light and humanity became a journey in eternity towards as it seemed to her now bewildered senses a goal which had no actual existence how long she wandered she did not know having lost count of time but finally her instinct moved her in the right direction and she gained the broad path but it was not the one she had strayed from as she speedily ascertained when she chanced upon a policeman the path to bayswater miss he said turning the bull's-eye light on her face and wondering at her haggard looks and bedraggled dress why you're right on the other side of the park miss near the statue patricia knew that this was so for above her in the foggy air rose the lofty pedestal of the achilles statue she must have wandered deviously across the vast space of the park and said so the policeman readily accepted her explanation and added one of his own i des say you got lost in the fog miss and no wonder for it's as thick as pea-soup hereabouts not the night for a young lady to be out miss he ended inquisitively and with a note of interrogation in his voice i came out on an errand said miss carroll faintly for the adventure had left her weak and wandered off the bayswater path near the serpentine and it's a mercy miss that you didn't fall in what will you do now miss patricia walked with him towards the gate near the clock call me a cab she said for although she could ill afford it she decided to drive as it was quite impossible to walk the fog forbade pedestrianism let alone that she was much too weary to trudge all the way to crook street what a cab miss certainly miss although it would be hard to find one in this fog and the constable whistled shrilly what is the time please patricia asked the same question as she had put to the other policeman half past eleven miss the girl uttered a cry of astonishment and well she might having left the home of art at half past eight she must have been wandering about for at least three hours it seemed centuries and she hastily made for the cab which drove slowly up looking like a spectre in the fog what would mrs pentreddle think of her being absent for so long but this question was nothing beside the one which the old lady was bound to ask with respect to the lost emerald tell the man to drive to number three crook street bayswater said patricia feverishly and bestowed herself in the hansom and here she handed the kindly policeman one of her precious coins which he accepted with a salute and gave the necessary direction to the driver in a few minutes patricia was on her homeward way thankful that her strange adventure had not cost her her life as it might have done but her thoughts were extremely unpleasant she had lost her umbrella which she could ill afford to do also the lantern of mrs pentreddle and worst of all the extraordinary jewel she had been sent to fetch how could she explain the only answer she could find was the very obvious one 
that it would be best to tell the truth then she began to think what words she would use until her head became confused and she dropped into an uneasy sleep meanwhile the cab crawled slowly and cautiously through the fog towards the home of art patricia was made aware that she had arrived at her destination by the sudden jerk of the vehicle as it came to a standstill then still sleep bemused she alighted in a stumbling manner to find herself in the arms of mrs sellers oh my dear where have you been it's terrible it's terrible and the good lady wrung her fat hands oh what is to be done what is terrible asked patricia stupidly for her head ached mrs pentreddle my own sister poor dear martha is dead dead patricia felt her weary legs give way with sheer terror dead repeated mrs sellers weeping murdered oh dear oh dear dead murdered patricia echoed the words faintly then fell unconscious at the feet of the weeping distracted old actress why did you go out where have you been martha is dead murdered she babbled incoherently End of chapter two chapter three of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter three afterwards patricia recovered her senses to find that she was lying on her own bed in her own room beside her sat fat mrs sellers with many restoratives and with a look of anxiety on her tearful face when miss carroll opened her eyes and asked vaguely where she was ma uttered an exclamation of pleasure and thankfulness oh what a fright you gave me dropping down as though you were shot she said producing a damp handkerchief i thought it was another murder and that you had taken poison or wait patricia with sudden vigour sat up in bed and grasped the woman's arm you used the word murder when i fainted and i use it now my dear said mrs sellers with some asperity what other word is to be used in connection with a cut throat a cut throat patricia stared at her blankly oh don't tie me down to words wailed mrs sellers placing her fat hands on her fat knees and rocking stabbed in the throat would be better i dare say if there can be any better in connection with the tragic death of my own and only sister martha and i never got on well together but ah yes interrupted patricia passing her hand across her forehead with a bewildered air as a full recollection of what had taken place came back to her suddenly mrs pendreddle has been murdered you said that and i fainted at the door and very naturally lamented mrs sellers dolefully i'm sure i'd faint myself if it wasn't that i am needed with doctors and policemen in the house and after such a happy evening too she continued placing her handkerchief to her red eyes sammy's play was such a success i'm sure it will go on at a west end theatre and have quite a run patricia ruthlessly cut short this babble as she was yet in the dark as to what had taken place during her absence will you tell me who killed mrs pentreddle she asked with some sharpness no i won't my dear because i can't my dear i should rather ask you that very question seeing that you were left in charge of her with that sprained foot of hers why did you go out and leave martha all alone in this big house and where did you go and why are you home so late and i shall answer all those questions in the presence of the police officer who has charge of the case said patricia firmly and gathering her irish wits together to face a very awkward situation i can exonerate myself oh my dear no one ever accused you someone might accuse me said the girl dryly people are always prone to believe the worst of one she scrambled off the bed will you please tell me exactly what has taken place while i bathe my face and change my dress what wonderful self-command you have my dear said mrs sellers admiringly it's a thing i never have had 
i'm sure when bunsen met me at the door to say that martha was lying in the drawing-room with her jugular bleeding and all the blood out of her body not that she ever had much poor dear you might have knocked me down with a feather i was fit for nothing and it was sammy who sent for the police fancy how good of him my dear seeing that he had the success of his drama on his mind and it is a very great success i can what did bunsen say demanded patricia keeping mrs sellers to the point from which confused by trouble she constantly strayed he met me and the rest at the door my dear when we came back from the theatre at eleven replied mrs sellers trying to calm herself his face was as white as a clown's but it was fear and not chalk with bunsen he and matilda and sarah and eliza got back at a quarter to eleven so that the supper might be seen too and no one has eaten the supper cried mrs sellers again going off at a tangent such a lovely supper too we expected to have a happy evening and here is martha lying on her bed a gory corpse with all the bedrooms upset by the villain what villain him who murdered poor martha whoever he is the scoundrel he first stabbed martha in the drawing-room and then hunted all through the bedrooms making hay as the boys say and every one just look at your own my dear miss carroll had already done so but she had hitherto believed that the open drawers with their tumbled contents the disordered wardrobe and the displaced furniture had been the work of mrs sellers i thought you had done this when you were attending to me but why should i demanded mrs sellers somewhat tartly it wouldn't have done you any good to have pulled your room to pieces in this way the police say he wanted something who wanted something the catif who robbed martha of her life retorted the ex-actress in her best theatrical manner he murdered the poor dear for something and as it wasn't on her whatever it is he searched the house whether he got it or not whatever it is i can't say nor can anyone else but he went out by the front door in spite of the drawing-room middle window being unfastened and where he's gone no one knows the middle drawing-room window could not have been unfastened said patricia raising her dripping face from the basin bunsen locked it before he went to the theatre well then it must have been open since my dear for the latch is undone and it has been pushed up a little way from the bottom martha couldn't have done it as her foot was so bad she couldn't have left the sofa i dare say the villain did it he could scarcely have opened the window from the outside said patricia mrs sellers shook her head mournfully i'm not so sure of that my dear was her reply the balcony runs along the front of all three windows and as they are old and shaky like all the house he could easily have slipped a knife between the upper and lower sashes and pressed back the snake but in that case mrs pentreddle thinking a burglar was trying to get in would have shrieked for assistance argued miss carroll who would hear her asked mrs sellers very pertinently there was no one in the house and i dare say no one in the road as scarcely anyone comes along so far as this on a foggy night too who would come here on a foggy night no the villain found poor martha all alone and stuck her like a pig you shouldn't have left her she asked me to she asked you to repeated mrs sellers her round eyes growing rounder with astonishment asked you to what to go on an errand and patricia checked herself as it was unnecessary to repeat her story twice and she wished to tell it in the presence of the police officer it's too long to tell you now she said hastily and looked in the glass to see that her hair was in order come downstairs and let me see the man in charge of the case oh wailed mrs sellers submitting to be led out of the room oh that i should have lived to hear martha called a case and bunsen called her the remains such an insult what did bunsen say exactly inquired patricia quickly he said that he and matilda and sarah and eliza came round by the back and entered the house by the kitchen while matilda made up the fire and put on the kettle bunsen went up to the dining-room to see if the supper was all right nothing was disturbed so he went to look into the drawing-room 
expecting to see martha and you but he only found martha lying dead and icy cold on the sofa covered with blood from her jugular vein she never did have much blood poor dear sobbed mrs sellers but what she had she lost for she died from losing it too hurriedly and what else did there's nothing else interrupted mrs sellers waving her arms in a dramatic manner everyone's upset and can't eat and can't go to bed and they're all sitting in the dining-room because inspector harkness won't let them sit in the drawing-room is inspector harkness the man i am to see yes he is in the drawing-room and told me to bring you to him as soon as you could stand he saw the cabman who brought you and asked him where you had entered the cab the man said at hyde park corner about half past eleven which may or may not be true for i can't understand what you should be doing there at this time of night it's quite true said miss carroll quietly i lost myself in the fog but why did you leave the house i shall explain that to inspector harkness dear ma patricia patted the disturbed old woman's shoulder kindly don't cry so i assure you i have nothing to do with the death of poor mrs pentreddle i never thought for one minute you had my dear said the poor landlady all the same martha is as dead as a doornail she is now with her late husband i expect though it can't be a very pleasant place where such a rascal has gone to not that i want to say anything bad against them that are gone for we may be the same to-morrow and so poor mrs sellers quite incoherent with grief and bewilderment maundered on aimlessly patricia was invited to enter the drawing-room by a jovial-looking man whose would-be military air did not suit his looks he was stout red-faced grey-haired and bluff in his manner resembling the typical john bull more than anything else he tried to be stiff but failed in his buckram civilities when he forgot that he was inspector harkness and remembered that he was primarily a human being miss carroll was so pretty and graceful in spite of her white face and drooping air the result of fatigue that the officer beamed on her approvingly but having placed a chair for her and one for mrs sellers who was to be present at the interview he became more aware that he had his duty to perform and looked as stern as he possibly could now young lady he said arranging some papers and getting ready to take notes what do you know of this matter nothing said patricia coolly and decisively she was now quite her own clever ready witted self as the difficulties of her position had acted upon her like a tonic in spite of inspector harkness's suave demeanour she was fully aware that he would not hesitate to arrest her if he believed she was in any way inculpated her curt answer rather annoyed him nothing he repeated sharply that is rather a strange denial to make in the face of the fact that you were the last person who saw this unfortunate lady alive do you deny that miss carroll no why should i i was with mrs pentreddle from the time mrs sellers left with the others for the curtain theatre half past six as we thought the house would be full interpolated ma sadly until nearly half past eight o'clock finished patricia calmly and after that asked harkness noting down this fact and acknowledgment i was wandering about hyde park lost in the fogs until half past eleven what took you to hyde park on this night mrs pentreddle asked me to go on an errand for her what was the errand what indeed said mrs sellers curiously martha poor dear was always of a very secretive disposition and never told me anything but as i am her own sister she ought to have told me what she wanted patricia took no notice of this remark but addressed herself to inspector harkness she wished to get the interview over so that she could retire to bed for she felt extremely tired and only her will-power enabled her to sustain the examination mrs pentreddle she explained and the officer took down her words had an appointment to-night with a man near the serpentine bridge on this side owing to her sprained ankle she could not go herself 
so she promised me five pounds if i would go in place of her at first i objected since the conditions under which i was to meet this man were so strange but when mrs pentreddle declared that failing me she would ring up a messenger boy on the telephone i thought that there could be nothing wrong and accepted the commission for the sake of the five pounds hinted the inspector patricia threw back her head proudly i am not rich and five pounds mean much to me she said simply but with a nervous flush yes i went for the sake of the five pounds though of course she added quietly i was quite willing to oblige mrs pentreddle in every way i refused the money at first but when she insisted upon paying me i was only too delighted to accept do you blame me well no acknowledged the officer after a pause but did you not think that five pounds was a rather large sum to pay for a simple errand and martha was so close-fisted as a rule put in mrs sellers the errand was not a simple one said patricia quickly there was a very great deal of mystery about it and she repeated the instructions which the dead woman had given her these both impressed the inspector and startled mrs sellers one would think that martha was a conspirator she exclaimed perhaps she was and perhaps she was not replied miss carroll wearily i have been puzzling over this question ever since the box was stolen stolen harkness rose suddenly to his feet and looked at the girl's pale face with an imperious glance what do you mean what i say answered patricia whose nerves were giving away a man came and snatched the jewel from my hand while i looked at it the jewel cried mrs sellers alertly what jewel the one which was in the deal box the box which this unknown man thrust into your hand asked harkness of course i should not have opened the box but i did so because patricia hesitated it seemed useless to tell these two very matter-of-fact people about the weird sensations which she had felt while holding the jewel as they would neither understand nor believe swiftly changing her mind she ended her sentence differently because the whole circumstances were so strange that i wished to know what was in the box you were afraid that mrs pentreddle had sent you on a nefarious errand yes i was and with good reason said patricia and harkness nodded approvingly mrs sellers disagreed why martha was a most religious woman and so good as to be almost unpleasant she would never have sent you on such an errand which had to do with anything wrong my dear you can judge for yourself said miss carroll quietly i am telling you all that has taken place harkness pondered you say that you left this house at half-past eight and wandered in hyde park until half-past eleven how can you prove this very easily mr inspector i met a policeman in crook street when i left the house and asked him the time he told me that it was half-past eight at half-past eleven i spoke to another policeman near the achilles statue saying i had lost myself in the fog i asked him the time also and told him to whisk me up a cab he said it was half past eleven and got me the cab mrs sellers told me in my bedroom that you had questioned the cabman sir so he must substantiate my story harkness nodded yes he told me that a policeman had put you in the cab at hyde park corner about the time you mentioned i see that you can account for leaving the house and returning to it but what were you doing in the meantime i have told you said patricia annoyed at having her word doubted yes you have told me but can you prove what you say luckily i can unless the things are stolen what things the umbrella the lantern and the empty box which i left on the bench in the broad bayswater path i was sitting there when the man robbed me what was the man who robbed you like i can't say it was foggy and he only remained for a single moment and what was the man who gave you the box like i can only make you the same answer said patricia both incidents happened so swiftly that i had no time to observe anything but if you will send to the park you will perhaps find the articles i left on the bench 
the inspector nodded and rising from his chair went out of the room mrs sellars caught the girl's hand when they were alone what does it all mean my dear she asked helplessly i can't say replied patricia shaking her head you know all that i know and must form your own opinion what is yours i have none i am quite bewildered at this moment inspector harkness re-entered the room and returned to his seat i have sent to the broad walk in hyde park he said bluffly so if your story is true the articles will be found my story is true said patricia flushing with anger but while i was away someone may have sat on the bench and and have taken the articles finished the officer dryly well yes but i hope for your sake that your tale a very strange one will be substantiated by these proofs do you believe that i am telling you a falsehood asked patricia in her most indignant manner i believe nothing and i say nothing until these articles are found and if they are not the inspector hesitated looked awkward and did not reply patricia stood up trying to control her nerves but quivering from head to foot perhaps you accuse me of murdering mrs pentreddle before i went out no dear no cried mrs sellars catching her hand kindly the doctor says that poor martha was murdered about ten o'clock and as you can prove that you were absent by means of those policemen and the cabman no one can accuse you of the crime and i know said mrs sellars bursting into tears that you wouldn't hurt a fly much less martha who liked you in her disagreeable way i am not accusing miss carroll i beg to say remarked the inspector as soon as he secured a moment to speak but this whole tale is so strange that miss carroll cannot blame me if i desire proofs naturally a high-spirited young lady doesn't like to be questioned in this way but i don't mind being questioned interrupted patricia her hot irish blood aflame but it is being doubted that i object to natural enough natural enough said harkness soothingly but one cannot bring personal feelings into legal matters i have daughters myself of your age miss carroll and i have every sympathy with your position as a man and as a father i fully believe every word you say but as an officer i am obliged to disbelieve until i have proofs if i do not demand them the jury and the coroner will when where asked patricia startled at the inquest you will be the most important witness miss carroll but i don't know who committed the crime no nor does anyone else but you can tell the coroner and the jury what you have told me and i hope that the articles you left on the bench will be forthcoming to prove the truth of your extraordinary story come miss carroll you must see that i am trying to make things as pleasant as possible for you consistent with my official responsibility yes said patricia and sat down again for after all she could not deny but what her story sounded very incredible and as yet she had not told the most incredible portion as that had to do with her own peculiar sixth sense which she was very certain neither the inspector nor mrs sellars possessed and as they had not got it how useless it would be as she fully recognized to relate the sensations caused by the stolen jewel her tale was improbable enough so there was no need to make it still more so can you describe what was stolen harkness asked her patricia did so and the explanation was received with exclamations of surprise by mrs sellars and with a somewhat sceptical air by the inspector patricia saw his doubts and grew annoyed again what is the use of my telling you things when you won't believe me before harkness could answer this very natural question a young constable entered and placed on the table the articles which had been left on the bench in the foggy park miss carroll spread out her hands triumphantly yes said the inspector interpreting the gesture i believe your story now young lady here are the proofs ah oh, yes groaned mrs sellars rocking but where is the jewel End of 
Chapter Three. Chapter Four of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four: The Inquest. Destiny works in a most mysterious way, and frequently the evil which she brings on individuals becomes the parent of good. During the three years which had passed since the death of her father, Patricia had faced much trouble for a girl of twenty-two. She had no money, and had possessed no friends, until she met with Mrs. Sellers, so her career had been a painful one of toil and penury and heartfelt despair this last misfortune which connected her with the commission of a crime seemed to be the greatest blow which had befallen her and she truly believed that she was now entirely ruined for who as she argued would engage as a governess a girl who was mixed up in so shady a business even if she could prove her innocence and she had no doubt on that score the mere fact of her errand to the park was so fantastic in the explanation that many people would believe she had invented it in order to shield herself from arrest in nine cases out of ten this might have happened but destiny ordained that patricia's case should be the tenth through the darkness of the clouds which environed her the sun of prosperity broke unexpectedly of course next day the newspapers contained details of the murder at the home of art and the mystery fascinated the public crook street was never so full since it had been a thoroughfare motor cars hansom cabs four-wheelers taxicabs carts bicycles and conveyances of every description came to the curved cul-de-sac also sightseers on foot came to survey the house and number three appeared in the daily illustrated papers when the reporters became more fully acquainted with what had taken place the portrait of patricia appeared also together with an account of how the murdered woman had induced her to leave the house it was generally considered notwithstanding that the errand had been proved to be a genuine one that mrs pentreddle had sent the girl away in order that she might see the mysterious person who had murdered her if this was not so argued everybody how came it that the man people were certain that the criminal was a man had gained admission into the house an examination of the snicks to the windows had proved that they were too stiff to be pressed back from the outside and indeed that the upper and lower sashes of the windows were so close together that the blade of a knife could not be slipped in between plainly the man could not have entered in this way so the only assumption that was natural appeared to be that the dead woman had admitted him by the door the fact that the middle window was unlatched and slightly open was accounted for by the presumption that the man had left in that way but why he should have chosen this odd means of exit when he could have more easily have left by the front door the theorists did not pretend to explain however the general opinion was that patricia's fantastic tale was true the finding of the articles on the bench and the evidence of the two policemen together with the cabman's statement proved this and that mrs pentreddle had got rid of her as an inconvenient witness to an unpleasant interview how unpleasant it had proved for mrs pentreddle herself could be plainly seen from the fact that she was now dead and that a jury and a coroner were about to sit on her remains harkness had gathered together what evidence he could which was not much and the reporters were all on the qui vive for startling revelations to be made the whole affair was so out of the ordinary that the journalists anxious to fill up the columns of their respective papers during the dull season made the most of the very excellent and unusual copy supplied to them they added to this they took away from that and so distorted the truth that plain facts became even more sensational than they truly were and this painting of the lily brought miss carroll into prominence as the heroine of the day the girl shrank 
from such sordid publicity but it was useless to try and hide as the searchlight of journalism played fiercely upon her that she was so pretty only added to the attractiveness of the unwholesome episode and when her portrait was published patricia received at least six offers of marriage all of these she naturally refused and was indeed very indignant that they should have been made mrs sellers was rather surprised at this indignation as having the instincts of a successful actress she looked on such publicity as an excellent advertisement my dear she said impressively two or three days after the murder and when the home of art was the centre of attraction to all morbid people sorry as i am that martha poor darling met with such a sad death there is no denying that the tragedy will do the house good oh cried patricia her highest instincts outrage how can you talk so i am a sensible woman and must talk so said ma firmly tears and sorrow won't bring martha back again and perhaps she is better where she is as she certainly never enjoyed life in a sensible way since this is the case let us take good out of evil i thought my dear that the home would have been ruined but instead of that it has become famous i could fill the place twice over as so many people wish to come but i intend to keep my present lodgers at the same prices never shall it be said that i made capital out of my dear sister's death but you my dear need not be so particular since you are not connected with her in a flesh and blood way as i am do you see patricia shivered no mrs sellers i really don't see i am connected with poor mrs pentreddle in a blood way certainly for if i had not gone out she would have been alive now well my dear you couldn't help going out since you had to go on the errand and no one knows better than i do how obstinate martha was well she's gone and as soon as they've settled who killed her we must send her to devonshire to devonshire echoed patricia surprised yes didn't i tell you that squire colpster whose housekeeper she was has come to london well he is in town now and called to see me to-day he is very shocked at martha's death and intends to take the body back to lay in beckley churchyard near that of her late husband or perhaps i should say its late husband although i am not sure that an it can have a husband it's very kind of the squire but the colpsters were always kind he is coming to see you this afternoon before the inquest takes place what about asked patricia uneasily he wishes to hear the story from your own lips it is in all the papers and much of what the papers say is untrue all the better advertisement said mrs sellers cheerfully i'm quite sure my dear that your troubles are over you can marry when you choose i certainly shan't marry those horrid men who have had the impertinence to write to me declared patricia indignantly oh i should if you find one of the men is nice and rich but if you don't feel inclined to marry you are at least sufficiently widely known to get a good situation patricia shuddered again and to her soul who would engage a girl connected with such a horrid crime lots of people said mrs sellers promptly and the crime is not so horrid as mysterious who can have murdered martha and why everyone is asking that question mrs sellers no one seems to obtain an answer observed the good lady mournfully not even inspector harkness or the police well my dear i must go and see about the dinner remember what i said to you you have a magnificent boom on just now and if you take full advantage of it you are made for life miss carroll did not know whether to laugh or to scold when ma left her but finally took refuge in quiet merriment notwithstanding her disgust at finding herself the centre of such a sordid sensation good-natured and kind as mrs sellers undoubtedly was the idea that she could urge any one as she phrased it to make capital out of her sister's death revolted patricia's finer feelings certainly since the old actress intended to retain her children 
even though she could have obtained more lucrative boarders she was behaving extraordinarily well considering her limitations but in spite of her own self-denial her theatrical instincts were so very strong that she had induced some one to make use of the advertisement as she could not bear to see such a chance of gaining a wide publicity wasted it quite grieved her that patricia should so persistently refuse especially when she considered that the girl required money but miss carroll not only declined to entertain the idea but kept as much as she could to her own room and refused interviews to several inquisitive reporters she has no business capabilities mourned ma to the playwright why if this had happened to me when i was on the stage i should have doubled my salary in a week and trebled it in a month which statement was undoubtedly true since the majority of people greatly enjoyed the morbid squire colpster as patricia learned the country gentleman was always called at beckley and also by mrs sellers who was a beckley woman appeared at the home of art immediately before the inquest was held and therefore had scanty opportunity of talking with the girl although he managed to exchange a few words he turned out to be a tall lean and rather bent man with a dry ivory-hued skin and gold-rimmed spectacles perched on an aquiline nose the term squire suited the john bull personality of inspector harkness better than it did this quiet student and patricia although she did not learn at the moment what mr colpster's particular studies were gathered that he passed the greater part of his days in a well-furnished library only the tragic death of an old and valued servant this gentleman hinted would have brought him up to london during the very damp month of november he spoke with considerable emotion poor martha how strange it is that she should have come to town to meet with this terrible doom i was never so shocked in my life as when i read the telegram sent by mrs sellers do you know why she came to london asked patricia bluntly mr colpster shook his head which was covered with rather long iron-gray hair in true student fashion i only know that martha wanted to go for a fortnight's jaunt to london her own words and i rather think although she did not say so added the squire musingly that she expected to meet her son harry who is a sailor is he in town now i believe so my nephew theodore dane told me that he had seen him over a week ago harry then said that he had returned from the far east and was going later to amsterdam for a few days if he has carried out his intention i expect that he is ignorant of his mother's death when he hears of it will he return immediately i think as harry is greatly attached to his mother if any one can find the assassin harry pentreddle will as he is smart and very tenacious of anything he takes up i wish i knew where he was in amsterdam miss carroll as i could then send him a telegram patricia pondered i wonder if he can throw any light on the motive for the commission of the crime it seems impossible as harry having been on a year's voyage has not seen his mother for twelve months it is just possible that as martha was a week in town before her murder she may have seen harry in the interval of course i understand that martha only sprained her foot on the night previous to her death she slept on the stairs said patricia mechanically her son certainly has not been here or mrs sellers would have told me have you any idea what caused the crime to be committed mr colpster pondered in his turn i rather think i will wait until the inquest is ended before answering that question he said judiciously but won't you answer it at the inquest so that the truth of the matter may be known urged the girl puzzled by his tone i may not be asked the question at the inquest said mr colpster blandly and declined to discuss the matter further indeed there was no time as they were summoned at this moment to the drawing-room where the jurymen under the control of the coroner were waiting for the various witnesses they had already inspected the body of the unfortunate woman 
which was lying in an upstairs bedroom as has been said before inspector harkness had very little evidence to lay before those in authority the criminal whether man or woman had disappeared in what seemed to be a magical manner all the officer could do and did do was to produce various witnesses to relate baldly what had taken place and these could say very little nothing could be proved save that martha pentreddle had been murdered but by whom and for what reason it was impossible to say the inspector gave a hurried sketch of all that had happened since he had been summoned to the home of art and then called his first witness and this was mrs sellers who wept a great deal and spoke volubly adopting her best dramatic manner so as to create a sensation for she was always mindful in spite of her genuine grief that what she said would be printed in all the great newspapers the chance of advertising herself as a retired star of the drama was too good to be lost but in spite of the good lady's volubility she had really very little information to give her sister mrs pentreddle had come to london six days previous to her death from devonshire where she was housekeeper to squire colpster ostensibly on the plea of shopping she had gone out a great deal but nearly always the witness was with her and the deceased had not spoken to any one in particular she had certainly mentioned that her son harry had returned from the far east and that she hoped to see him before she returned to devonshire but harry had neither written nor had he called and i should have been so pleased to see harry who is a very charming nephew to have ended mrs sellers with doubtful grammar did the deceased mention that she was expecting any one on the night she was murdered asked the coroner gravely oh dear me no sir had she done so i should have forbidden her to receive a single person as she was slightly feverish from a sprain caused by slipping on the stairs and was not in a condition to see any one in fact i was most unwilling to leave her but she implored me to do so as she knew how interested i was in the drama of mr samuel amersham but only on the condition that someone remained to look after her did i agree to go miss carroll kindly promised to remain so i departed quite happy only to return said mrs sellers with a burst of emotion to find that martha was gone to that bourne whence no traveller returns the deceased never hinted to you that she was in danger of her life never she was quite happy that is as happy as she could be with her religious views which were extremely dull she had no idea of dying for she told me that she hoped harry would return with her to devonshire did you know of anything in her life which led you to believe that she had an enemy who desired her death certainly not martha never made an enemy in her life although she certainly was the reverse of agreeable she was as dull as i am bright said mrs sellers blushing comedy and tragedy pa called us and this remark ended the examination as the witness apparently could throw no light on the darkness which environed the crime the doctor who had been called in to examine the body stated that the deceased had been murdered by some sharp instrument being thrust into the throat this had pierced the jugular vein and the miserable woman becoming unconscious almost at once had slowly bled to death her hair was in disorder and when discovered her body was lying half on and half off the sofa it was the doctor's opinion that the assassin grasping the hair had drawn back his victim's head so that he could the more easily accomplish his deadly purpose from the nature of the wound it was probably inflicted by a fine and narrow blade witness thought that a stiletto might have been used from the condition of the body death had undoubtedly taken place at ten o'clock but probably since the death was caused by hemorrhage deceased must have been struck down some minutes earlier this was all the medical evidence obtainable and although it proved clearly how mrs pentreddle died could not show who had committed the crime but the use of the word stiletto gave the coroner an idea 
only a foreigner would use such a weapon he remarked the witness disagreed the word suggests an italian because it is the name of a weapon extensively employed by the bravi of the middle ages but a murderer of any other nation would use it just as naturally if it came to hand besides i only assume from the nature of the wound the smallness of the orifice that a stiletto was used i am sure that i am right however and the coroner rather agreed as he also was a doctor and had seen the wound himself could there have been a stiletto in the house he asked generally yes cried mrs sellers unexpectedly from her seat near the door and became prodigiously excited what's that asked the coroner as the doctor stepped away from the place assigned to witnesses what do you say mrs sellers at once occupied the vacated position now i remember that only three days before poor dear martha met with her death i was showing her some of my old stage dresses there was a page's costume i wore in the duke's motto and with it were the jewels and a stiletto pooh pooh a stage weapon said the coroner contemptuously not at all a friend of mine who admired my acting gave me a real italian stiletto to wear in the part a very dangerous weapon it was sharp and pointed i dare say martha was killed with that have you missed it no i put away the dresses and never thought of looking but martha could easily have taken it while my back was turned just wait sir and i'll go and see and before the coroner could give permission mrs sellers as active as a young girl was out of the room there was a pause as it was impossible to continue the examination of other witnesses until this important point was settled every one looked at one another but no one spoke as it was felt that here at least was a tangible clue in a very short space of time mrs sellers returned red-faced and out of breath waving an empty sheet it's not here she declared quickly and giving the gold embroidered sheet to the coroner this is all that i found martha must have taken the stiletto but why should she demanded the coroner doubtfully ask me another said mrs sellers vulgarly and with a shrug there was only one inference to be drawn from the absence of the weapon mrs pentreddle knew that she was in danger and had therefore armed herself against a possible attempt being made on her life End of chapter four chapter five of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter five the inquest continued until it came to the examination of patricia very little was learned from the depositions of the various witnesses summoned to give evidence all that the boarders and the servants could say was that mrs pentreddle although not an extremely sociable person had behaved herself quietly in every way she had kept very much to herself and had mentioned her business in coming to london to no one and certainly she had never hinted in the slightest degree that she possessed an enemy who desired to take her life all who dwelt beneath the hospitable roof of the home of art expressed themselves surprised at the death of the poor woman there was nothing apparent on the surface of things as one witness observed to lead up to such a catastrophe it was entirely unexpected and unforeseen bunsen the butler deposed that before leaving the house with his fellow-servants for the theatre he had locked the three drawing-room windows when the police examined the room afterwards the middle one of these had been found unfastened and slightly open it assuredly would not have been difficult for the assassin to have come along the iron balcony to that window and there have tapped for admittance but bunsen swore positively that unless the deceased had opened the window the man could not have entered it was this witness who had found the body and he stated that he had not touched it until it was seen by inspector harkness and his underlings it was at this point and in answer to the question of a juryman 
but the inspector admitted the absence of the weapon with which the deceased had been killed no stiletto had been found either in the drawing-room or in any part of the house so it was presumed that the criminal must have taken it away with him i wonder that he did not place the stiletto in the hand of the dead woman so that it might be supposed she had committed suicide said a juryman probably he did not think that it would be proved that the deceased had taken the stiletto from her sister's room when the stage costumes were being displayed suggested another juryman we have not yet learned if the murder was committed with that weapon was the coroner's remark call george colpster then came the turn of the squire to be examined but he could tell nothing likely to aid in the discovery of the criminal mrs pentreddle he declared had been his housekeeper for over twenty years and had rarely gone away on a holiday she had asked him for a fortnight's leave so that she might pay a visit to mrs sellers in london and this he had readily granted she had never told him the reason why she wished to go to london but he presumed at the time that she intended to see her sailor son during her stay when this fact or rather this suggested fact became known the coroner recalled mrs sellers and learned again what he might have known he had learned before had he referred to his notes that harry pentreddle had never been near the house when mrs sellers stepped away again from the position allotted to the witnesses squire colpster finished his evidence by swearing solemnly that his housekeeper had never hinted that she was in danger of her life yet she must have thought so observed a juryman else she would not have taken the stiletto we have not yet proved that the murder was committed with that weapon snapped the coroner once more of course the real interest of the case truly began when patricia carroll was sworn since she apparently knew more about the matter than did any one else and moreover had been the last person to see mrs pentreddle alive she gave her evidence quietly and clearly relating all that had taken place from the time mrs pentreddle had asked her to go on the errand to the time she returned to learn that during her absence the wretched woman had been stabbed but on this occasion as on the other when harkness had questioned her patricia left out any confession of her sensations when holding the stolen jewel she judged and very wisely too that any statement of this kind would be put down to hysteria both the coroner and the jurymen questioned and cross-questioned the witness but in no way could they cause her to deviate from the details she originally gave mrs pentreddle had promised to explain all about the matter when the witness returned but her unforeseen death had ended all chance of explanation in that quarter but was the death unforeseen by you asked the coroner catching at the word used by patricia certainly she replied readily i expected to find mrs pentreddle ready to receive me when i returned and expected to receive your five pounds no sir i had failed in the errand she had asked me to do therefore i did not desire to be paid can you describe the appearance of the man who placed the box in your hand and the appearance of the thief no i told you so before both men came and went in a flash and even if they had waited it would have been impossible for me to have noticed their dress and looks as the fog was so thick and the night was so dark did either man speak no each came and went in silence the policemen both in crook street and at hyde park corner proved that they had met patricia and that she had severally asked them the time also the cabman deposed to driving the young lady back to the home of art so without any difficulty whatsoever it was proved that miss carroll had been absent from the house when the crime had been committed the crook street policeman also swore that he had seen no suspicious people haunting his beat and the fog was so thick ended this witness that it would have been difficult to see any one unless some one ran into my arms as the young lady did it was a pea-soup night sir this concluded all the evidence which harkness was able to get 
and after a pause the coroner began his speech but before he got very far the door of the drawing-room was hastily flung open and sammy amersham the playwright dashed in holding a dagger aloft it's the stiletto he cried triumphantly and clapped it down on the table under the coroner's nose when you were asking questions about it i remembered the unfastened middle window and wondered if the assassin had opened the same to throw the weapon into the area when he had killed poor mrs pentreddle i went down and searched and found it he must have thrown it out as i guessed and then have stepped in to close the window and leave by the front door there's blood on it too is this your stiletto mrs sellers asked the coroner passing it along the woman shuddered as she took it it's mine sure enough she said and there's blood on the handle Ugh! she dropped it martha's blood sammy the playwright was sworn and stated again how he had found the weapon in the area below the iron balcony among some rubbish said mr emerson is the area ever used asked the coroner quickly no called out mrs sellers the tradespeople go round to the back by the side passage and the gate in the iron railings round the area has been locked ever since i have been in this house no one would think of looking for the stiletto there the last witness did said the coroner dryly shows that he's got the markings of a dramatist said mrs sellers proudly although no one saw the connection between the coroner's assertion and her comment one thing was clear from the discovery of the weapon in the area namely that mrs pentreddle must have been afraid of an attack else she would never have armed herself by stealing the dagger from her sister also it was certain that sammy's shrewd explanation was feasible and that the assassin after killing the unfortunate woman had opened the window to drop the stiletto into the unused area the deceased must have expected a visitor on that night said the coroner musingly and probably sent miss carroll away so that she could see him undisturbed she did not tell me that she expected any one said patricia quickly no she would not seeing that she evidently desired to have a secret interview as she was alone in the house she assuredly must have admitted him she could not leave the sofa with her sprained foot cried mrs sellers perhaps she could not have crawled to the front door remarked the coroner but her will evidently enabled her to crawl to the middle window and open it why should the man have come to the middle window by appointment impossible said mrs sellers nervously in the first place martha would have told me had she intended to see any one and pardon me no madam interrupted the coroner sharply the very fact that the deceased sent away miss carroll showed that she desired the interview to be a secret one she would not have admitted a man who intended to murder her but she did no one else could have admitted him and the fact of the open middle window showed how he was admitted he opened that to throw out the stiletto probably he did that but undoubtedly the window was open before mrs pentreddle could not have crawled to the front door martha had so strong a will that she would have crawled to the top of the house if she had made up her mind to and i say again she never would have let in a man whoever he was to murder her poor dear i don't believe she expected to be murdered but the dagger precisely madam the criminal did not bring it with him therefore he did not enter this house with the intention of committing a crime the deceased was afraid of this man and thus took your stiletto so as to keep him at his distance probably she threatened him with it and there was a struggle during which she was murdered then the assassin searched the house for what asked mrs sellers shaking her head sadly for this strange jewel described by miss carroll it wasn't in martha's position when quite so interrupted the coroner dryly but the assassin evidently believed that mrs pentreddle possessed it he struggled with her to see if it was concealed upon her and when she drew forth the stiletto with which she had provided herself 
it was used to kill her then the assassin as i said before searched the bedrooms one thing i would ask you mrs sellers before we close the evidence did anyone know that mrs pentreddle would be alone on the night of her death she wasn't alone miss carroll was with her yes i know but did anyone know that the house would be empty i can't say of course sammy's play was talked about a lot and everyone said they were going i even let the servants go and yes yes but do you think anyone outside the house knew that there would be a clear field i can't say mrs sellers shook her head i talked a lot to everyone both outside and in saying that we were going but i don't know anyone who would have murdered poor martha the coroner's speech was not very long as really there was little to say whether mrs pentreddle had really expected someone and had therefore sent away miss carroll so that the interview might be private it was quite impossible to prove in any way that the deceased anticipated danger was more or less clearly shown by her theft of the stiletto from her sister undoubtedly the assassin as the nature of the wound and the presence of bloodstains on the handle of the weapon suggested had turned the dead woman's means of defence against herself finally the idea that the criminal desired the jewels stolen from patricia in the park was equally impossible of proof in fact ended the coroner wearily for his business had been exhausting beyond the undoubted truth that mrs pentreddle is dead we can prove nothing in any way this was also the opinion of the jurymen which was very natural considering the scanty nature of the evidence without any hesitation the ordinary verdict given in doubtful cases was brought in wilful murder against some person or persons unknown said the jury and all present felt that nothing more and nothing less could be said under the sad circumstances and i don't believe that they'll ever learn who slaughtered poor martha sighed mrs sellers over a cup of tea when every one save the boarders had departed we'll just bury her in devonshire beside her husband and try to be cheerful again whatever harry will say when he learns i don't know for he was desperately fond of his mother i'm sorry for that murdering villain if harry ever lays hands on him but he never will bless you my dears and most people believe that mrs sellers spoke the truth the whole affair was mysterious and it was confidently asserted that the murder of mrs pentreddle would be relegated to the list of undiscovered crimes the immediate result of the inquest was an offer made by a prominent music hall manager to patricia as the heroine of the crook street crime it was suggested that she should appear on the stage in a pretty frock and relate her experiences in hyde park at a salary of two hundred pounds a week the magnificence of this chance almost took away mrs sellers breath and she was greatly disappointed when patricia refused to make a show of herself the girl phrased it in this way and indignantly declined oh my dear cried mrs sellers almost weeping you need money so badly i would sooner need it all my life than degrade myself in this way retorted miss carroll looking prettier than ever with her cheeks flushed and her eyes sparkling how dare the men insult me insult my dear two hundred pounds a week an insult take it yourself mrs sellers replied patricia impatiently after all poor mrs pentreddle was your sister and you will be just as great an object of interest to the crowd as i would be i'm not young and pretty my dear it's those things that tell patricia shrugged her shoulders well i refuse and i have written to the man saying that i cannot accept his offer you refuse good money you refuse to get married whatever are you going to do for a livelihood mrs sellers was in despair over this obstinacy patricia shrugged her shoulders once more oh i dare say i shall manage to earn my living in some decent way perhaps mr colpster may help me what makes you think so he is coming to see me this evening i know he is coming said mrs sellers but i thought it was to see the last of poor martha's remains he takes them to beckley to-morrow by the afternoon train 
i should have gone myself to attend the funeral but it is impossible to leave the children she looked at patricia curiously i wonder if he wants to marry you my dear i hope not said miss carroll hastily how your thoughts do run on marriage mrs sellers well you are too pretty to remain single miss carroll said the old actress frankly sammy would marry you if you would only encourage him and i can tell you sammy amersham has a great future then i shan't hamper him with a wife but what makes you think that mr colpster wishes to marry me isn't there a mrs colpster there was but she died long long ago he has one daughter called by the odd name of mara but she will not inherit the estates as the squire wants a man to manage them he has two nephews you know my dear theodore who is the eldest and basil who is an officer in the royal navy i don't know which of the two squire colpster favours as his heir but whosoever gets the estates will have to change his name he ought to give his daughter the estates said patricia decidedly well i am not so sure of that my dear you see from what martha said it seems that mara colpster is queer how do you mean queer she is that is they think her really mrs sellers broke off with a puzzled look i hardly know what to say she's queer that's all about it for martha told me very little i rather think the squire wants her to marry either basil or theodore then justice would be done all round but here i am talking cried mrs sellers rising slowly to her feet when there is so much to be done with getting poor martha ready for her last journey i have to see the undertaker and his men my dear and mrs sellers waddled away in a great hurry patricia wondered what mr colpster wished to see her about and wondered also what could be the matter with the girl so oddly termed mara this last piece of curiosity was not gratified for some days but she learned the first two hours later when squire colpster interviewed her in mrs sellers private sitting-room what he said to her took her breath away i return to beckley to-morrow with the corpse of my housekeeper said the squire in his dry way and it struck me that you might be willing to come with me to devonshire come with you mr colpster gasped patricia thunderstruck yes he said simply and directly you see martha is dead and i want someone both to look after the house and to be a companion to my daughter to mara queried patricia remembering what mrs sellers had said ah you know her name the squire looked up quickly mrs sellers told me mr colpster nodded i expect poor martha has been talking he said in a vexed tone and no doubt has been making out mara to be weak-minded mrs sellers said that miss colpster was queer said patricia truthfully she is not queer declared the father with some sharpness mara is a dreamy girl who wants a brisk companion to arouse her from what i have seen of you miss carroll you are the very person to do mara good so if you like to come for one hundred a year i shall be delighted to engage you oh patricia colored but on this occasion with joy of all the offers that had been made to her this one pleased her the best of all i accept with the greatest pleasure but the salary is too large not at all we live very quietly and you will find it somewhat dull also i shall want you to look after the servants now that martha has gone mara is incapable of doing so well i accept as i said before mr colpster said patricia promptly in that case he rose to take his leave i shall expect you to come with me to-morrow i hope to leave paddington station at four fifteen i shall be there said miss carroll with sparkling eyes i have little to pack and no friends save mrs sellers to take leave of and when squire colpster went away she thanked god that she was now provided with a home out of the evil of mrs pentreddle's death good had come End of chapter five